So during this pause, you might begin by just noticing if any part of your body's uh, habitually been tensing itself and see if you can just soften a little. Just relax your shoulders. You might soften the hands. Take a few full breaths. Sense the possibility of smiling into your eyes so the brow is smooth. Slight smile at the mouth. And see if you can smile into the heart sense that, that openness that has room for whatever's there, that receptivity. And let your mind now go to whatever you feel grateful for in your life. I'd like to invite you to whisper what you feel grateful for. Don't worry because nobody's listening, everybody else is just reflecting and whispering themselves. So just begin to whisper, I feel grateful for, and then just fill in the blank. I feel grateful. It could be a person, it could be a part of nature that you love, any experience that you relish. Just let the mind be open and receptive, whatever comes. You might choose one thing that really stands out to you right now and whisper that again. And actually let it be felt in the body. Let gratitude just fill you up. get to know gratitude. You might just, if, if there's uh, a person that it involves, just imagine just saying thank you. And if it's not, just say thank you to the universe. Just whisper thank you and see what happens. Thank you. And then maybe again, until it comes from the most sincere place that you know. glass is not half empty. It's overflowing, to be sure. (coughs) Okay, so that's the first area of practice of planting seeds in the garden. The second is the actual practice of savoring. We move through the day and there are many spots of unpleasantness and pleasantness. But we tend to just kind of roll right over them. And so one of the practices the Buddha described as gladdening the mind is to pause and to linger and to immerse in what is bringing delight. 
This is part of gladdening the mind. E.B. White writes, I wake up each morning torn between the desire to serve and the desire to savor. Okay. On the day that I ate my peach, I got this from a friend on the West Coast. <laughs> Our peach tree bore the most magnificent fruit this year and last night Alice and I picked all the remaining ones before our trip to the Southeast. We had a peach orgy with whipped cream and lots of swooning. Wish you could have been there with us. <laughs> so, good email. That's savoring. A lot of swooning. Isn't that great? Hmm. So it takes a commitment to savor. In other words, just as I mentioned earlier, to be kind, we have to swerve regularly from our path. To savor, you have to be willing to stop that engine that keeps thinking it's on its way somewhere else, right? We have to kind of get off that track and just stop. And so when something delightful arises, like for, instance, for me it was the sound of the rain, it might be the beauty of the night sky or maybe you're somebody that you love is laughing and you just love to watch them laugh. I mean it's great to watch people you love laughing, to see them happy, you know, it's really fun. You witness some kindness, just stop. Take it in and sense well, what does it really feel like to take that in? Find out. It's an investigation. It's, it's been described by psychologists as memorizing the experience. We have many templates for unpleasant experiences. They're very familiar. And we have a sense of a self that's having an unpleasant experience. So what happens when we start really attending to and memorizing and being familiar with pleasant experiences? New neural pathways, right? So it's a felt sense in the body that we're paying attention to. I mean, I have a, a way that I um, explore this on my morning walks, which is that I, I do random pauses. Whenever I can think of it, I'll just stop wherever I am. And it doesn't have to be the most scenic spot. In fact, I try to stop, I try to remember and pause in odd places so I can catch myself in that tumbling forward and say, oh, what's it like right this moment? And so that I can come back to that sensibility that this is it. That there's not another time on planet Earth or in this life that we're waiting for. That this moment right here with us all together, us exploring this, this moment, right this moment, this is as much it as anything in the universe. If we don't have that capacity to really stop and open to the kind of timeless sense of this, we'll never really be doing it. It'll be an idea. And we'll always be tumbling forward. So we pause. And we pause when there's some pleasantness and start really, oh, what's it like? For me, I'll pause and I'll open my senses, because that's the way I do it. I just listen, let the sounds wash through. I'll relax my body and sense that the whole dance of sensations is washing through. And then I start sensing that what I am is that space it's all washing through. And there's this vastness and this tenderness and this aliveness, and that's all there is. Savoring just getting to know that. So there's an interesting uh, finding when there's research on aging and that is that elderly people are actually not grumpier but they're happier than younger people. And again, these are, I, they might sound too much of a generalization but here's what the idea is that when we're younger we fixate on the future more, more about worries and accomplishment and where am I going and what needs to be different and what's going to go wrong. As we get older, mortality becomes more real. And with that, there's motivation to enjoy the moments. And I am aware of that with my mom. My mom who's now 86 um, much more than when she was younger. We'll go for a walk and she'll, oh, look at that. And it's just, a, it's a leaf and it's a leaf I've seen 10,000 times. Whoa, look at that. It's a 
or the fires. This is a beautiful fire tonight because we have a wood-burning stove and we watch the fire sometimes when we have dinner. Or the dinner, or the taste of the food. She really gets into it. She knows she doesn't have that long. She's savoring. Alicia here told me about her father who's uh, just told me this tonight, I think, 94. His memory's going and all, you know, his, the aging's happening. He gets frustrated because he used to be really clear and be able to remember everything. Then he says, I'm not going to focus on frustration. He invites her outside. He says, look at that sun. That sun's my friend. He says, this sun is so generous. It's so warm. It's so beautiful. This is a real, st this is real. This is what he does. He has the sense of, of really savoring this life. 94. So, Einstein puts it quite simply. He says, there's two ways to live this life. He says, you can live as if nothing's a miracle and the other way is as if everything's a miracle. Where our attention goes, energy flows. If we are in that jaded place, skeptical, cynical, judgmental, that's the experience we live in and it's got a very strong sense of self that goes with it. When we start cultivating gratitude, when they're savoring, the self-sense becomes more transparent and there's a light that's always been there that starts becoming more luminous, more obvious, more visible. We're letting something shine. This is, um, the poet Kabir says that when we're really waking up, every leaf teaches us about the Dharma. And there's a story about another Kabir who's a shoemaker who, as he works, he's, you know, he's really savoring and, and enjoying and he's repeating the mantra Ram, 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 because Ram's the name of God and he's just feeling the divine or the sacred in everything. So day in, day out, he's going Ram, Ram, Ram. 20 years and one day Ram appears and Kabir goes, who are you? And he goes, I'm Ram, you know. <laughs> well, why are you here? Well, I'm here because you've been calling me for years. Now I've come. What do you want? <laughs> I don't want anything. What? You've been repeating my name over and over. And then Kabir says, I just love repeating your name. And then for the years to come, wherever Kabir would go, he'd hear, be followed by Ram and the sound, Kabir, Kabir, <laughs> Kabir. <laughs> So we've talked about two ways of gladdening the mind, of uh, some people call it looking towards the good, and one way is that gratitude, and one way is savoring. The third way is the one that many of you have done with me and in other places called metta or loving kindness, where we pay attention to the goodness in ourselves and each other, and as we pay attention to that, to that light in each other, there's a natural loving that comes. And again, just like with gratitude, you can reflect on it and feel it, or you can look at someone and say, I love you, and find out how that loving presence actually flowers. Action, okay? So, how do we cultivate loving kindness? Whatever you pay attention to, that softens and opens your heart is a practice of loving-kindness, whatever you pay attention to. This week, uh, one of my loving-kindness practices was I have a book by Jennifer Holland, who is actually a local author, called <coughs> Unlikely Friendships. And it's a beautifully illustrated book about different species that have, for different reasons, come together and paired up and, and become, uh, you know, have a real loving bond. And it usually happens because as very young, one, you know, baby gets abandoned and then it gets linked up with another creature who takes it in. So there's a lot of these different examples. And some of them have gone viral and you've probably heard about them the tortoise and the hippo. Many of you probably heard about that. An elephant and a dog, there's a great story about that. One of the ones that touched me was that well-known 230-pound 230, 230 gorilla, Coco. And 
the pictures were so great, I was just wanted to share it with you. You can find, if you look up gorilla and kitten, you'll see it. Just Google that. But uh, what happened was Coco could sign and communicate amazingly. And um, her teacher was reading her books. And her two favorites were Puss in Boots and Three Little Kittens. Now, Coco got really lonely and restless, and she kept signing that she wanted a kitten. And they were worried, because, you know, this is a big gorilla, and, you know, how's she going to do with the tiny little kitten? But they gave her the pick of a litter, and she picked a little kitten, and she named it. Let's see what she named it. I wrote it down. All ball. All ball. You know, it's like just a little ball. Um, and she was smitten, and she treated it like a baby, and she was incredibly gentle, and she tried to nurse it, and she played with it. Well, there's a sad part to this story, because that kitten got hit by a car, got escaped and got hit by a car, and Coco went into deep, deep grief. And this is a real bond. And after a certain amount of time, she was willing to, you know, she was with two, she got two more kittens. And so you see pictures of her then with two more kittens, and they're climbing all over her, and she's again holding them gently. There's something about this bond between species that we sense the sentience and the light that shines through all beings and how we're constructed differently in some ways, but what's in common is so deep and so pure and so beautiful. Again, it reminds us of the goodness. It reminds us of the goodness. That's why all those people liked the Facebook entry with the twins, because there's some innate light that shines through when we see one little infant embracing another. It's beyond our rational mind. It's just part of being. So on a research level, we know that as we cultivate loving connection with other beings, we get happier. The parts of the brain that have to do with happiness light up. It just, it's there. Older people with pets are happier. People with, with social networks that are meaningful are happier. What happens is rather than self-centered thoughts all the time, our, our attention shifts. Where energy goes, I and mean, where attention goes, energy flows. We shift and we become larger. We become enlarged when we're in love. We're not so caught in that story of a separate self. Parts of our brain light up that are parts that, that, that perceive unitive kind of being. The boundaries are dissolved some. And if we need it, we can get back into that survival self and take care of ourselves. It's not like all of a sudden it's just all, you know, la-la land. But we have access to a part of our being that makes us more whole. Maybe the last story I'll share with you, because this practice of, of loving kindness enlarges us, opens us beyond the small self, and enlarges those that we pay attention to. And this story I heard through uh, Rachel Naomi Raman about a, a uh, physician, head of, head of Department of Medicine on the East Coast, one of the East Coast institutions, and he saw, he would see homeless women and men and, and he'd work with them and one woman in this story would come to visit him once a month and, you know, it was hard for her to get there and her speech was sometimes rambling, her clothing was eccentric, she, she had a, and she had a hard life. But this doctor was not, he was really respectful. He didn't, he, what he was seeing was not homeless woman, socioeconomic status. He didn't make her into an other. He just saw her humanity, her goodness. And they would talk and she would leave and, you know, it was good. Well, what was interesting, and at first the clinic nurses were really puzzled, is that she would come to the clinic on days when he wasn't there. And she knew he wasn't there. And she simply wanted to go to his consulting room, and she, but she didn't go in. She would stand on the threshold of the room and deliberately place her right foot inside the empty room and then withdraw it. And then she'd put it in and then she'd withdraw it. So she was drawn to this place where there was loving presence. And the places where we are seen and heard are holy places. 
and when we can offer that space, when we sense another's goodness and let them know it, when we sense another's goodness and express our love, we wake it up and bring out that light. When someone really listens to you, accepts you, sees your sincerity, sees your dedication to waking up, sees who you are, it allows that light to shine. It opens you up. It brings it forth. So we'll close tonight um, in a way that I, I hope you enjoy. We'll, we'll do a metta uh, meditation and then we'll be listening a little to uh, something that expresses a bit of the flavor of what we've been exploring. So find yourself a way of sitting that is comfortable, that allows you to be alert. And my sense is that as we explore this garden of the mind, the very first step, coming back to basics, is right in this moment to sense your intention. This, this intention to move towards wholeness, to connect with the fullness of who you are, to wake up these potentials for happiness and love and gratitude is part of this unfolding to wholeness. When we're suffering, it's because our sense of self is organized around something's wrong. Part of waking up is remembering the goodness. So we gladden the mind, we remember what we're grateful for, we commit to savoring. And we practice seeing the goodness in ourselves and each other. You might begin with your own being right now and just take a moment to appreciate whatever you can appreciate about the life that's right here. And if it helps you to look through the eyes of someone who sees you in, a, in an awake and wise and understanding way, that's fine too. To sense your honesty, to sense your longing to be awake and present and happy, to sense this growing wisdom and compassion. You might experiment with putting your hand on your own heart because part of loving-kindness practice is action and the action of offering kindness through your hand as you now sense what is the wish you'd like to offer to yourself right now? What's the blessing? And you might vary the touch of your hand so it's tender and just offer to yourself whatever blessing you might wish for yourself in this moment. and then bring to mind someone who you care about that you'd like to uh, reflect on for a few moments. Somebody who you're close to. And sense what it is that makes you love this person. What do you appreciate about this person?
You might sense their humor. You might imagine this person laughing and sense their aliveness. You might sense this person's way of showing you love, the look in their eyes when they're loving. And take a moment to imagine letting that person know their goodness. Just imagine that you're expressing what you see. Just even a piece of it. And imagine saying to them, I love you. And just see and feel their response. And let your attention come now to the actual feelings in your heart so you can sense what is this loving presence like? Is it light? Is it warmth? How big does it want to be? What happens when you let that light really be as luminous as it is, or that warmth, or that energy? Is there any edge to it? Can you imagine that? One loving presence that's here, all of us converging, spreading out in all directions as a field of caring so that we can bring to mind now, including in this light and love, all beings. Sensing these hearts, these shared heart space, holding all beings, wishing all beings the blessings of happiness. May all beings be happy. May all beings touch great and natural peace. May all beings know the wonder of being alive. May all beings everywhere realize their essence, the light of their essential being and let it shine infinitely in all directions.